Hey, it's Jim, and this is FRM Part 2, the topic on credit risk measurement and management, and the chapter on central clearing. The first couple of pages in this chapter is really a focus on a history lesson. And the takeaway is on the management of what used to be called back in the way old days, just regular old default risk. And then we kind of refine that to call it third party risk. Now, in this concept of central clearing, we're going to call it counterparty risk. Now, the idea is that if we centralize this clearing function, we'll go ahead and reduce default risk, reduce third party risk, reduce counterparty risk. But one of the cool sentences in one of those early paragraphs is that back in the old days, that if a clearing member defaulted on a trade, they were fined, they were fined substantially, and then they were kicked out. You know, so there's this idea that, okay, we're trying to reduce this counterparty risk, but if we're kicking people out of, uh, of the process, then uh, maybe we're actually increasing counterparty risk. So I'll show you a slide at the end of this deck that, uh, that illustrates that kind of a trade-off between, you know, we want to be able to do this in a powerful way, but we don't want it to cost too much. So I gave away a couple of the learning objectives. So define a central counterparty. We'll spend a couple of slides on that. We'll talk about novation and netting. We'll do margins, which we've talked about uh, at length before. We'll do a waterfall, and I, I want you to take a picture of one of those slides in there. And we'll talk about bilateral and central clearing. We'll do that at the beginning, and then we'll do that once again at the end. And then there's initial margins and default funds. If I go back to this lost waterfall, you know, just think about like the, uh, you know, the hedge fund thing where you have the waterfall and you fill up and you fill up and you fill up. You know, it's pretty similar to that. And then there's a couple of slides on advantages and disadvantages of central clearing. I'll have you take a picture of those as well. That last uh, learning objective, there's probably five really good questions in there. So let's go ahead and start with just the definition of a central counterparty. What image did I give you before? I went like this, right? It's just a central party. So look over at the little square. Is that not quite a square? Maybe that's a rectangle, the CCP over there. So that's central clearing, as opposed to parties A, B, and C having to deal with each other. So you have arrows going every which way. Who keeps track of all that stuff? Well, A keeps track of it, B keeps track of it, and C keeps track of it. But what if these three people uh, disagree on something? That's why we, we create this uh, central counterparty in the middle, and that's the responsibility of the CCP to keep track of all this stuff. So as you can imagine, because we have one party doing all of this clearing, there's probably going to be the benefits of standardization, just like we had in the futures market. There's probably going to be benefits of more liquidity and uh, an evaluation of market volume like we have in the options market and in the swap market. But look at that third arrow point. This is a really good, uh, this is a really good exam question, I think. Manages operational complexity through client clearing. So look, A and B and C over under bilateral clearing, they don't really need to worry about the complexity. It's removed because we throw that little rectangle in the middle. Now, the real life illustration is a little bit more complex, and I want you to think about this from a geographic standpoint. So look in the middle, there's our regular old central counterparty, but then in the outside, in the purple, these are clearing members. So think of these clearing members as, you know, the big old powerful financial institutions out there. I'm sure that many of you guys out there are uh, clearing members and then you have the C's all the way out, you know, kind of like the satellites. Those are non-clearing members. So those are probably smaller, maybe regional financial institutions. I mean, I imagine I could be a non-clearing member if I really wanted to be. You know, I'd have to meet some, uh, some conditions like, okay, Jim, how much money do you have? Or what kind of assets do you have? And I could say, well, I could put my John Deere tractor up as collateral. Uh, that, probably, uh, that probably wouldn't get it. But what I want you to do is think about this complexification. Think about the six Ds, the six clearing members there as regions of the United States, 
Now, we don't really need to think about these as regions, but it really helps. So, you know, the D up in the top right, uh, that person is in charge of, you know, Maine and Vermont. Uh, the D going this way, that he's in charge of Ocean City, Maryland. The D down there, Florida. The D over there, Texas. The D over there, California. And the D over there, Washington and Oregon. And so these clearing members, they can be separated, probably not through regionalization or geography, like I just said, although they surely could be, but maybe through product lines. You know, maybe the upper D where I said, what was that, Maine and Vermont, maybe that D does just collateralized debt obligations. And then you have these other derivatives around. And so you have all of these non-clearing members. And the reason they're non-clearing members is probably because they're smaller, but they either don't want to or, they, uh, or, or they're not capable or they don't have the ability to obtain the clearing license. Remember, that's, uh, that's what those clearing members have done. So if you look at all the arrows in there, you know, life is super simple back here. We have A, B, and C with the rectangle in the middle, but the reality is that it's probably more complex than that. So you have all sorts of arrows going uh, backwards and forwards and upwards and downwards. So on the exam, look for, uh, uh, the word interconnected and how can those uh, how can we manage the interconnectedness and I mean imagine if I went back here try to take this thing here and remove the central counterparty from this so you have a and b and you have letters all the way up to z you got arrows going every which way nobody has any idea what's going on so clearly even though this illustration looks like it's more complex than this dude over here on the right which of course it is it's still way less complex than what it would look like if we just had the a b and c with bilateral clearing all right, clearing members, I've given you a little hint about these kind of things. So they must meet admission criteria. So credit rating and capital base. So my John Deere riding mower is prob probably not going to be enough. But a second requirement is that there has to be a financial commitment uh, to the central counterparty's default fund. Now, we'll talk about margins and default funds in just a few minutes. But think about it this way. Um, if these clearing members contribute to a default fund, here, let me go back here, and somebody inside of this maze defaults, well, then we have this fund to go ahead and support those losses. And what that does is that it increases the liquidity, it increases the marketability, it increases the trust that you and I, who let's say we buy mortgage-backed securities, the trust that we have that you know the clearing is going to be uh, done in an efficient manner. And then, depending on what kind of a derivative that we buy uh, at the end, that, that default risk, that counterparty risk um, will be minimized. Um, some kind of operational requirements, yeah, frequent margin posting, participation in fire drills. That's a word that uh, that we use inside of this model that is kind of like stress testing. You know, we have all these stress tests for banks. Well, this is a similar, it's not identical, but it's a similar kind of an event where we say something like, you know, we have a fire. What if, you know, the D up there in Vermont and the D down here, what did I say, Texas? What if those two people, what if they default? Let's have a fire drill and see how the other four Ds, how they react. You know, is the default fund sufficient? What did we do with the margin? Can we bring somebody up here? Imagine there's somebody up there at the, at the top. Let's call this person a P. Imagine there's a P who could step in and take over some of those positions if we do it in some kind of an auction. Now, most of the times the auction occurs between and among all the clearing and non-clearing members, but it doesn't have to be, right? There we go. What's that last bullet point say? This is what I said earlier, large global banks. All right, clearing costs. We'll do a little bit more of this later on in the slide deck, but we have direct fees and indirect fees, and those indirect fees probably include things like interest held on those assets. Uh, CCPs need to be resilient. That makes sense. Expertise and competition. That makes sense. Look down at the bottom. I think this might be an interesting question. Um, you know, suppose that GARP says something like, hey, we have a model, and let's go back here. We have a model, maybe it looks like this, maybe it looks like that, but we have a model where we can minimize, we can minimize all of these trading costs. So what does that mean? Well, if everybody has the minimum trading costs, well, 
maybe, maybe, just maybe, that that's going to increase their profitability. But we've got to balance that with some risk management proposition. So we might have this thing uh, race to the bottom. This is this is almost exactly like what has been going on on the floor of the equity markets where, remember, we used to have, what did we used to trade in, you know, quarters and, and halves and eighths of a dollar. Then they went to decimalization around the turn of the century. And now, you know, some of these bid ask spreads are a penny, may, maybe even less. So where is someone going to be out there who can make money if you're doing uh, if you're just trading, if you're making just a penny, a penny per trade? Well, maybe the high frequency traders are. <laughs> Ooh, that's a conversation for a different day. All right. So we have this concept of bifurcation, and that just simply means that we split it in half. Right. So we've got these two different contracts. And so this is a little bit of what I was saying earlier. We can do this uh, regionally for currencies. You know, so just think about, you know, here in North America, you've got the Canadian dollar, you got the US dollar, you have the Mexican peso. And so you might need these regional bifurcation models so that we can deal in those three currencies. And then we can deal in different kinds of derivative products. This is what I was saying earlier with, the, what did I say, collateralized debt obligations or a credit default swap or a futures contract or an option, whatever it is there. So that's a really good question. Remember, regional and product uh, bifurcation. Um, look at some of those uh, teardrop points down at the bottom. Um, you know, the practical clearing means that, you know, if we go back here to this thing, you know, what is the practicality if, and let's just take the C up at the top, where would that be? Let's say that C is in uh, Minnesota, and then the C down at the bottom, where that, that would be in Texas. So imagine you have these two people who are trading with each other, and they go this way and that way and this way and that way and this way to, you know, to get through the central counterparty. And, you know, so what are we trying to say here? You know, what is that practical clearing? So we need to make, uh, we, we need to, you know, have some kind of an idea. And the chapter says, you know, 80% uh, are clearable. Uh, that sounds like an okay number to me. I can't imagine that Garp would ask you about that 80%. I mean, clearly, clearly, if you, if you do not have this bifurcation, if you do not have central clearing, maybe 20% of the over-the-counter derivatives would be clearable. That doesn't mean that all of them wouldn't be cleared, but clearable meaning that there are distinguishing arrows between and among all of those things. So we, we need to worry about regulatory preferences and then mandatory clearing simply means that if we have, you know, this is kind of like, it's not exactly, but it's kind of like that, you know, the back in the, when did this concept arise, 1988 or whatever, that the too big to fail. So you have mandatory clearing of these standardized contracts. You want to make sure that you clear the biggest and the boldest and the most important trades. I mean, if I'm trading with you and we're trading, you know, $100, worth of the Canadian dollar. Who, who really cares about that in the market? But we care if it's a trillion dollars, well, then that's important. All right, we can have this uh, vertical model like this or the horizontal model. And so a um, couple of good differences here. Why don't you take a picture of this? There's some good exam questions in there. So the integration, that's linked to the specific exchanges for direct clearing. So think about the vertical here. So you have exchange, 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 or exchange and then clearing members, you know, something like that. And then uh, this works mostly on the in the futures exchange. Now over on the horizontal uh, central counterparty model, this is going to be a little bit more flexible. So that's probably a really good example. You know, over here, we've got, uh, we've got streamlined operations. We've got the futures exchange. So this is pretty standardized. Over here, we have market flexibility. So remember, like organized exchanges here and then over the counter markets over here um, to illustrate some of those differences. Yeah, what did I say earlier? Standardization, yeah, complexity, yeah, liquidity. We did all that volume over there. And then this idea of wrong way risk. We've talked about this, I think, before. And this shows up in multiple chapters uh, throughout the FRM program. But think about that wrong way risk as being the result of a trade. I mean, let's suppose that you and I, we agree to a forward contract. 
and let's suppose it's the year 2023, and I agree to buy NVIDIA stock from you uh, a year from now for, let's say, I don't know, $100 or $200, right? So those of you who follow along the stock market will know that in 2024, NVIDIA was up to, you know, $700, $800. So a year from now, what's happening? Hey, look, I can settle this contract because I agreed to buy at, what did I say, $100 or $200. Now it's trading at, let's say, $800. I can't wait until, uh, until we settle. So I have to start worrying about your default risk. Are you going to decide to pay me? But then wrong way risk is the is the two things, right? Two, two bad things that happen at the same time. So maybe, let's just take a simple example. Maybe you lose your job. So now, now this is wrong way risk. Now, not only can you not pay me that, am I worried about you paying me that big amount? Now you have something else bad going on in your life. That's that really sappy 70s love song. There's your homework assignment. You guys, you're not young. You're not old enough to remember the song. Just when I needed you most. What a sappy 70s love song. So just when you need this central clearing to kick in, something bad happens to uh, to that counterparty that has nothing to do with the actual contract. You know, and there are really two things. This is like systematic and unsystematic risk. So what could happen to you that's bad? Well, some kind of a market event like inflation or something, or it could be an unsystematic like like losing your job. So this is probably a really good couple of exam questions. Tell me, you know, the question stem could be something about, uh, let's go ahead and talk about uh, efficient replacement of defaults. Uh, what it, would that be? And you would say liquidity. I don't think this slide is too terribly important. Here's a list of uh, uh, different locations uh, throughout the world. And here are these CCPs down the right hand side. Now, of course, none of this would work unless we had this legal ability to go ahead and write separate contracts. And so that's exactly what happens. And this is called novation. So what the central counterparty does, it writes a contract to A and it writes a contract to B. Therefore, A and B, they don't ever have to know each other. They don't even need to know that they exist. I mean, somewhere along the line they exist, uh, but the, the central counterparty then is liable to pay A and liable to pay B regardless of what happens during the course, uh, during the course of the trading. You know, so look at some of these, uh, some of these bullet points. Yeah. CCP between buyers and sellers. Yeah, we talked about that. Eliminating direct risk. So the central counterparty acts as an insurance company or as an insurer. This is a legal and binding contract. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So they're matched. Of course, A and B. I mean, A up top, that's not going to be a contract for a credit default swap. And B down below is going to be a contract for a collateralized debt obligation. So there has to be matching. There's anonymity, nobody knows A and B, they don't know each other, and there's, uh, and there's the matched book. Of course, what's going to happen then is we're going to net these, uh, these trades. Netting reduces all of some of the complexity. I mean, it's really nothing more complex than, I mean, if we have one trade and you owe me $10 and we have another trade and I owe you $5, there's no reason for us to trade the 10 and the 5. Why don't we just settle with, uh, with the $5? So there we go, netting. And then here's a really simple example. So the bilateral market, we have all this stuff going on. And then we introduce we introduce the central counterparty, but we still have arrows going in both directions. But when you net, you have fewer arrows going in both directions and you have fewer dollars or whatever the currency is going in, uh, going in both directions. So that should make perfect sense. You can also compress. Look at this example here. So if you and I have 15 trades that's grossly exposed $2 million, what we can do is look at those trades and we can put them in a vice and squeeze them. We can compress them. So it's actually really only six transactions. I mean, there's a skill set in being able to compress. You compress them to six, Gross exposure is now only 600,000, but net exposure is still the same. So that's really important. That's probably the really good exam question. Note that after compression, gross exposure is compressed, but net exposure is unaffected. Boy, if I were writing exam questions, that would be one that would be uh, at the top of my list. 
All right, to have this conversation about margins, just go back to uh, what we know about futures exchanges. You know, if you go to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange webpage, you can go to all these different sorts of contracts. Like, for example, go to the uh, go to the butter futures contract um, or the cheese futures contract. I think it has I think it has cash settled in both in both of those. And if you look at the specs and you look at the margins, you know, I think it's 20,000 pounds of butter is the standard amount. And the initial margin might be, oh man, maybe $1,000, maybe $1,400, something like that. Um, so what are we doing? This margin, it's really just a buffer. So look at the, you know, this kind of accounting definition here, the primary defense against losses. And we'll see that in a slide here in just a few minutes. So we have this initial margin, which is usually pretty high. It's relatively high. Um, the cool thing about futures exchanges and all of the other over-the-counter markets in the world is that they tend, not all of them, but they tend to allow you to use treasury securities as part of that initial margin. And if you have to sell those to settle, well then, I mean, seriously, how hard is it to sell a treasury security, right? There are tons of people out there willing, uh, willing, to, um, willing to buy those things. But then we have this thing called a maintenance margin or a variation margin. Remember, lots of exchanges, like a future exchange, marks to market every day and requires daily settlement. So some days that you're going to win, some days you're going to lose. But this variation margin, you need to put up cash because if you lose, you need to put up, let's say, $100 because that opposite position is expecting to get $100 in cash. That opposite position doesn't want $100 in treasury bills or $100 in my John Deere riding mower, right? So look at that immediate settlement nature. Those of you who are Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd fans, you I bet you know this by heart. You know at the end of the movie there in Trading Places, uh, the dude from the exchange says, you owe us $394 million. You know our uh, accounts are settled every day. And so that works with all of these other markets here. Whatever kind of a derivative, maybe we don't have to daily settle, but maybe we'll settle weekly, maybe we'll settle quarterly, whenever, whenever it is. Uh, but we're still going to mark to market every day so we know what the value of that contract is. And then we can do all sorts of netting. And then there at the bottom, there's that, there's that concept of the default fund. So all of the members deposit into this default fund. So think about this. You have the traders out there who put up an initial margin and then are responsible for the variation margin. So if there are losses, then that variation and that initial margin acts as the first buffer. But then if those losses exceed the margin, well, then you have this default fund. And so what this means is that everybody who's a member, they contribute. Suppose everybody puts in $100, right? And if we have $75 worth of loss, you reach into the pot and you throw that $75 into whatever direction that is. Yeah, extreme loss coverage. Uh, that default fund is designed to absorb losses um, that exceed the coverage by margins, but it's not going to cover an infinite amount of losses. You know, think about what happened in trading places, Eddie Murphy and Dan Ackward, what they did is that they shorted orange juice futures contract at a price up here, and then the price fell. Now, Mortimer and Randolph Duke, Randolph Duke, the most they could have lost was whatever that price of orange juice was all the way down to zero, right? But if you have the opposite position, I mean, you could go out to infinity. So you can absorb some of these losses with the default fund, but not all of those losses. So think about, you know, we talk about uh, value at risk. We talk about expected exposure in that left hand tail. We talk about all that stuff. So what we want to do is we want to mutualize those losses. We want to get everybody involved. Think about it. You guys ever watched that movie Witness with Harrison Ford? That's a long time movie. He's a, he's a detective and he goes undercover into the Amish community and uh, an Amish couple, they get married. And so everybody chips in and one day they go build a barn. It's a really cool scene. Everyone's chipping in. They bring the lumber, they bring the water, they bring the nails and the hammers and everybody. So this is mutualization of losses. In the movie, this was mutualization of love for our neighbor. So we build, we build a barn for this young couple. Here, we're doing the opposite. We're going to say, you know what? Maybe your house burned down. We're going to go ahead and help you with, uh, with that loss.
And of course, we, we need to worry about this, you know, concept of moral hazard that, boy, if I'm going to take the risk and I don't have to pay for all of it, well, then I'm going to take more risk. I'll let these other poor dudes take the risk. All right, it should be obvious that, especially from a couple of those illustrations we had, what, you know, eight or 10 slides ago, that what we're doing now is we are shifting, we're transferring this counterparty risk from all of the parties out there to the central counterparty. You know, so this is that first arrow, uh, diamond point there, reliance on CCP's overall credit quality. What, what did I say earlier? You know, if I wanted to be a central counterparty, I would have to put up more than just my John Deere tractor in terms of uh, credit quality and income needs and all that kind of stuff. So what that means then is that all of the counterparties really don't need to keep track of each other, but they need to keep track of the central counterparty. You know, so what does uh, what does this mean? How do we evaluate the counterparty risk associated with the central counterparty? Well, they don't let anybody in, right? So they employ, employ strict membership criteria. They collect the variation and in the initial margins. They collect this default fund. And then there's this process of the default management process, which includes things like, hey, you know what? We've got all these trades here. Maybe we need to hedge inside of this market or outside of that market or somewhere else. We need to worry about who is available to participate in an auction if we have a def major default or multiple defaults. Remember, of course, now that default Defaults don't have correlations of zero. You know, when the economy is tanking, those default correlations, they move to, well, probably not one, but they clearly move towards one. And so if we have all of these defaults, then we need to have hedging and a strategy. So that's the default management process. Now look down at that illustration on the bottom right. You've heard me say this many, many times. I say this to my students almost every day in class, that as a good risk manager, you need to identify the risk, you need to quantify the risk, and then you need to manage the risk. But you can see now that, you know, I have three things, but GARP has more than three things. So there's the identify, the assess, that's probably part of the quantify, and then the manage, I call it manage. So here are the four components of manage, analyze, control, transfer, and reduce. So how do we do all that stuff? Well, we need robust pricing models. We need market standard valuation. We need regular updates. Here, I'm just going to say it. We need to read the Wall Street Journal every day so we know what's going on in the bond market and the stock market, and then what's going on in the, all the derivatives market as it relates to the Fed, as it relates to interest rate, as it interest rates, as it relates to all sorts of things. Don't forget the component of collateral. So look down at the bottom, varied collateral types. Now you guys, hopefully you've been watching my videos for a while. What kind of collateral can we use? We can use my John Deere tractor. That's probably not going to be very good. We can use treasury bills. That's probably going to be acceptable to a lot of people. But what is the greatest piece of collateral that I have ever talked about in these videos? Of course, it's the, and I'm hoping you all said, the Pink Panther Diamond. All right, what did I say early on here that one of the things that the central counterparty does for us is that it probably increases the liquidity because we have confidence that that counterparty risk is being managed adequately. So, of course, uh, of course, if we want to get out, we ought to be able to get our money out of the contract or whatever market it is. So we should have transient uh, liquidity. Um, because sometimes we have some derivative securities that don't have nearly the liquidity that we, uh, that we would like it to have. All right, so what are these risk management techniques? This makes perfect sense, right? Um, uh, sufficient liquid assets to meet those margin calls. What are we going to do with those margins? Well, we're probably going to go and buy some treasury securities, right? Highly liquid, low risk assets. And then we want to establish these liquidity facilities. And we'll probably do this with a financial institution. So we'll work with an individual in a financial institution whose sole job, maybe not sole job, but whose at least half job is to make sure that the central counterparty is 
is liquid to meet all of the, remember, we got all these trades going back and forth to meet all of those liquidity needs. And, you know, I, I say this to you guys regularly, and I say, I say this to my students. It's super helpful just to think of a big old Excel spreadsheet. And so this liquidity facility has an Excel spreadsheet and then probably has a Monte Carlo simulation behind it saying, all right, if we change this and this and this, let's go ahead and run it over and over and over again. And every night that Monte Carlo simulation runs and we come to work the next morning and we say, OK, this is what is facing us today. Liquidity facilities that that should make perfect sense. Now, what happens? What happens if we're worried that that counterparty is going to default. So we have this period. This is called the margin period of risk. And these are the losses due to the possibility or the likelihood of default, probably due to changes in market prices, whether it's the market price of my John Deere tractor or the market, market price of a mortgage-backed security. So this margin period of risk goes from today until when that default is going to or is expected to occur. Now, we can't just say something like, oh, you know what? That's going to happen in two weeks uh, or 20 days. I'm not going to worry about it until next week. After all, I have golf tournaments this weekend. I got to watch soccer on TV. I got to do something. I'll worry about it some other day. That, that's not the way this works. I mean, what we need to do is manage this margin period of risk from today, and we need, to we need to monitor it every day. So there we have daily and intradaily collateral calls so that during this margin period of risk, we can, we can, minimize, we can minimize our losses. It enables us to close out those positions more quickly. That makes sense. Oh, and there's periodic fire drills. I was telling you about that early. All right, what happens if we have a clearing member default? Well, think about I'm not going to go back all the way to that uh, illustration with the CCP and then the D's and the C's, but visualize that in your brain. If you have a clearing member that defaults, there were a bunch of arrows going in and out of that particular D, right? So now, now we have these unmatched trades. So how do we do this? Well, we can figure out a way to have somebody else take over these things. And what we can do is we can auction them, we can assign them, we can ask the government to come in and bail us out, uh, although I'm not quite sure that would happen. But hey, you know, here in the United States, the government bails out lots and lots of people. And then look at the bottom there. We have this default management group. So we have we have this default fund somewhere in there. Let's figure out how to optimally use those. And of course, we can do some macro hedging, right? As a CCP, we can go out to another market and we can say, you know what? We think that this particular member is going to default. And that particular member, remember, it's a financial institution. Maybe that particular member has uh, a tremendous ownership in mortgage-backed securities on the left-hand side of its balance sheet. So we can go over here in this, uh, in this market and we can hedge, we can macro hedge by if, that, if those mortgage-backed securities, if they all default, probably because interest rates have spiked, let's say, then we can make an interest, bet over, interest rate bet over here in a different market. So macro hedging, that should make perfect sense. So what does this mean? Liquid transactions, default management group, that, that stuff is uh, self-explanatory. Now the auction, what we can do is we can just pretend like we're in a James Bond movie. You remember in the great movie, uh, Roger Moore as James Bond, he bid on the Fabergé egg. So we can have an auction just like that, but it's probably not going to work exactly that way because you have all these members and they're probably either very aware or at least semi-aware of all of the possibilities of default. And they'll say something like, you know what, if that dude over there defaults, I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and take over this position and that position and this position. And so the auction can work almost any way. And remember, as a central counterparty, we want to make sure that auction is successful and it occurs uh, today, even if, even if there's uh, tons and tons of haircuts involved. Yeah, here's just a concept of fire drills and this, this porting. Porting is just what I was talking about here. Just 
transferring the contract from one person, porting, porting, right, transporting from one position to another. You can go through all the fire drills you want, and that's important concept here. But when you do the fire drills, you need to make sure that you go to these members over here and say, do you really want to drive this car? You know, they're the driving tests to verify auction participation. You know, like if those of you who love James Bond like I do, you'll know that Roger Moore as James Bond, he was just faking everybody out. Even though he bid on the Fabergé egg, he didn't really want to own it. Uh, especially because he was uh, bidding uh, large and large amounts, but he wanted to he wanted to find out who really wanted that, and that was going to be the bad guy. And of course, it turned out to be the bad guy. All right, so there's uh, there's this concept of haircutting up there. Of course, if we have a default and there's a position, you know, like my position and your position, what did I say? We agreed to trade, I agreed to buy NVIDIA for $200 and now it's $800. So, so essentially you owe me $600, but what are my choices? Since you defaulted, I, I could take $0. Now I could take you to court, but maybe I have to spend $1,000 on court fees. So I'm willing to take a haircut. I'll say, all right, you owe me $600, pay me 500 and I'll be happy. And then you'll say, pay, we'll pay you 400. Will you be happy? And next thing you know, we arrive at some number and then, uh, and then nobody's really happy, but people are satisfied that this uh, central counterparty system is, is working. Uh, the tear up strategy, what we can do is this thing here. We can just say, you know what? <laughs> You're out of luck. <laughs> we can also say to our members, hey, you know what, whether you like it or not, you're going to go ahead and take over Jim's contract with his neighbor over here, and you owe Jim $600 on that NVIDIA forward contract, forced allocation. So how do you determine this forced allocation? It's like playing the lottery. Let's go ahead and flip a coin a couple of times. Do you remember in Seinfeld where Jerry and George flipped a coin to get the apartment? So you do this, you lose, then you have to take over uh, take over uh, Jim's position. So here's this lost waterfall I was telling you about, similar to the uh, to the hedge fund thing. You know, so what happens? We've got this initial margin, then we have the default fund, and then we have this thing called, you know, skin in the game. So it's really just an allocation of capital to all the members that say something like, you know what, whatever those losses are, we'll go ahead and we'll share them, we'll share them, and we'll go ahead and put this skin in the game. You know, we have our skin in the game. Um, then we have the default fund from all of the defaulting members. So that first default fund is just, you know, whatever that defaulter had put in. Uh, and then we have the non-defaulting members. And then we have rights assessment and loss allocation, remaining capital, and then liquidity support. So these last three are kind of like they're like the Fed, lenders of last resort. And so if the losses ever get down, here, let me go back here real quick. You know, here's the waterfall. If the losses ever get down to this point, well, then we need to worry about the, a couple of those things that we talked about earlier, like tearing up or assigning or whatever those things are. Here's where I wanted you to take a picture of this, compare bilateral and central clearing. There's a ton of good questions in here, but we've talked about almost all of these things in here. So you got a picture of that. Now, what about the default funds here and their, uh, and their cost and moral hazard? Remember, moral hazard is just some kind of a decision that's made because you know, you know that somebody else is going to bear some or all or most of the losses. You know, so your risk taking behavior changes. Now, the default fund in the defaulter, plus if you skip down a little bit, there's the default fund of all the non defaulting members. You know, this is provides for great loss absorbency because there's this mutualization of losses that that makes perfect sense. And then we have these initial margins. So think about this. Um, you know, you can have initial margins that are this big. You can have initial margins that are this big. So if you have initial margins that are just this big, well, then that waterfall is going to flow down to everybody else more quickly. On the other hand, if you have margin, initial margins that are this big, well, then those things, uh, uh, those things will be able to absorb the daily price movements in whatever that underlying asset is. The problem is that if you make initial margins this big, you're going to lose out on some of the demand for that product. So clearly there's an optimal initial margin somewhere in there. 
I promise you there's a college professor out there who's done a research paper on optimal initial margins. So whatever that turns out to be, well, then, then that's what it is. All right, what about moral hazard and portability? Um, you know, those higher initial margins, this is what I was saying, those probably result in, uh, in higher clearing costs because they're gonna have lower default funds. On the other hand, um, those initial margins, they promote this transportability because it's absorbing all of this. And if you absorb most of those losses and then you only have this much of a loss, there's still a default, but then you can assign it to somebody else or some, you can auction it off or somebody's gonna be willing to take over it. Um, so let me go to this next slide here. This is what I was talking about with my little things like this. So look over on the left, we have the initial margin, which is the big red chunk up at the top. And then the default funds for each member is just a smaller amount. These are higher costs. So whatever those higher costs are, that's going to be super high when you have a large initial margin. But if you do the opposite, if you have a smaller initial margin, like the blue on the right, well, then you're going to have this loss mutualization and you're gonna have lower costs. So the question then becomes, this is marginal cost, uh, marginal benefit kind of a scenario. So what do we want? Uh, maybe we want the purple in the middle, which, uh, which uh, is a trade-off between the higher costs and the loss mutualization. So that's probably a really good exam question. So let's go ahead and end quickly. Take a picture of this advantages of central clearing. We did all this stuff here, right? And then disadvantages of central clearing. Um, what do we need to talk about in there? Okay, so there's adverse selection. I didn't mention that at all. Um, remember, adverse selection is based on the assumption that there is information asymmetry that one party knows more than another party. So look at the example that we came up with here, you know, underpricing because somebody withholds risk information. Remember, when you trade with somebody who knows more than you do, you're always going to lose. That's adverse selection. So it should be obvious that that is a, an important concept in this whole idea of uh, counterparty risk. So you have a picture of this one here. I think we talked about all this stuff. Picture of this one here. We did most of that stuff here, and that takes us uh, that takes us to the end. So you know, one of the good things about this. Um, this chapter for some of you is that there's no math. And it's probably one of the bad things for some of you because there's no math. You know me, I love to do math because it's really hard to argue with one plus one equals two, but there are lots and lots of good questions in here. And I think, I think if you just remember this as a component of default risk, and then you think about the difference between the bilateral and the central counterparty, I think you'd be able to answer all these questions, but there's no doubt that you need to know all the definitions inside of this chapter. So, hey, thanks for watching. You have a beautiful day and good luck studying.